Okay, John, chapter 19, verse 28. So here, this is Jesus on the cross here, moments before his death. Verse 28 says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Verse 29, now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead... They did not break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. For these were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken." And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, I pray first of all, Lord, that I would not be a hindrance a hindrance of of you saying everything that you want to say and just being heard by the, the brothers and sisters here, Lord. Lord, I am I'm weak. I'm, the psalmist says that I read this morning, I'm poor and feeble. I'm just a man with feet of clay, Lord. I, I pray, Father, that you would use me in spite of all that as a vessel. Because, Lord, here there's just so much. Is there really your, all the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, there's so much. But here, Lord, so sobering. This event, central in history, crucifixion of your son. I don't want to be a hindrance to anyone hearing that. I don't want to be a hindrance to a heart being torn or a heart being encouraged. Someone that needs warning or exhortation. Lord, I, I, I pray, Father, you say you're, you're seeking those to worship you in spirit and truth, and that's our prayer, Lord, for the worship time we've already had, but also for this time that at the end, that we are worshiping at the end of this word that, you, that you're delivering. I pray that for, for our church and every church that's in Boston, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may be seated.
So, can there be any doubt as you look around at what is happening on planet Earth? Can there be any doubt that man needs a savior? Oh my. Is that true? Can there be any doubt as you look at, at man trying to sort of solve things that he can't do it? Man can't save himself. He needs a savior. How can man save itself? Man so often is his own worst enemy. How can I save myself? How can you save yourself? I'm my own worst enemy. I know that much about myself. I need a savior. And so do you. Why, what did the angel of the Lord say to Joseph, the husband of Mary? His betrothed Mary. The betrothal is sort of a, a contractual engagement. Was pregnant. He had never known her. Meaning he had never, they had not consummated a, a marriage and she's pregnant. And, and, and what, did the, what did the angel of the Lord say to him? He said, you shall call the baby's name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew one twenty one. the word Jesus, Greek uh, form of Joshua. Joshua means Jehovah saves. You'll name him Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. Oh, how we need a Savior. What did the angels declare to the shepherds? Luke chapter 2, verse 11, when Jesus was born. They declared to them, There is born to, to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So that's what we said at his birth. Now, so here in John 19, verse 30, moments before his death, Jesus, the Savior, cries out, it is finished. What is finished? Everything that was necessary for you and I to be saved, for the world to be saved. Jesus, perfect in his life, tempted in every way, just as you and I have been, yet without sin. It's finished. That's been accomplished. What else is finished? On the cross, he took on our sin, our guilt. He was punished by God the Father for our sin. As we read last week, Isaiah 53.10, it says it pleased the Father to bruise him. That, that, that had been accomplished. That had been, it's finished. It's done. It's finished. It's done. What, what happened in Genesis 2, second chapter of the Bible, God said, let us make man in our image. That image of God, the, the, the likeness of God, that reflection of God, the, the glory of God had been ruined by sin. But now, chapter 19, John, verse 30, it's finished. Everything that was necessary to restore what was lost by sin. Finished, done, accomplished. It was finished, and then verse 30 says, Jesus bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now, next, in John chapter 19, we read some detail that we did not read, or you will not read, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke about what happened with Jesus between the time he died and the time he was taken down from the cross, that short period of time. You read some things that were not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, of course, John written 30 or 40 years after those books. So let's, let's read about this, this detail that John felt it was important to include important to the story that we need to hear. So it starts in verse 31. 
Jesus says, it is finished. He's bowed his head. He gave up his, his spirit. And then verse 31 says, therefore, because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate, Pilate was the Roman governor, he was the Roman judge who had given Jesus over to be crucified. They asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Okay, so what is that about? Why, why did the Jews not want the bodies on the cross on the Sabbath? The Sabbath being the seventh, the last day of the week, Jewish week. Day of rest, a day dedicated to uh, the Lord. Well, you know, throughout the Old Testament, time and time and time and time again, there are verses which are a foreshadowing of Jesus the Messiah. His life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Now, one of the many, many, many verses is in Deuteronomy chapter 21, which we just posted last week, by the way, online. It says this, and this is a foreshadowing of what you just read about in this verse. It says this, If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, yes, this is gory, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. Now in the Galatians, the Apostle Paul uh, attributes this exact verse. He quotes it to Jesus. Jesus became a curse for you. He broke that curse. For you. So what's happening here is, the idea here is that leaving a dead body on a tree, and remember throughout the Bible, a tree and a cross used interchangeably, would uh, particularly have been a no-no on a Sabbath. It, it, they didn't want it to remain overnight on any day, but particularly on a Sabbath, and that's the point of uh, verse 30. One. Now, remember, Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath, last day of the week, it actually didn't begin in the morning, it began at dusk. So from dusk to dusk was the Sabbath. And so they went to Pilate and they said, hey, look, this is not okay, having bodies um, on, uh, on, on a tree, on a cross, on a Sabbath day, but particularly this one, because it's in the middle of their Passover feast. And that's why it says in the middle of verse 31, it says, that Sabbath was a high day. In other words, a Sabbath that was in the middle of one of their religious feasts, it's a Passover. Now that's a really, really, really important Sabbath. Can't enjoy your roasted lamb if there's a dead body that's been hanging. And, and they're thinking of Deuteronomy and Jesus, a fulfillment of all that, a foreshadowing of it. They didn't want his body to be laying on the cross overnight. So they go to the Roman judge, the Roman governor, Pilate. They request that the legs be broken. That's what it says in verse 31. They request that the legs be broken. So what's that about? Well, we've talked about this in weeks past. Crucifixion, many times people died by asphyxiation, meaning they can't breathe, suffocation. And that's because, you know, don't, excuse me, don't do this yourself, but, but if, you, if you're hanging by two hands, your, your, your whole body's going to be going down, and, and when you do that, that you can't breathe. You have to elevate your body, and as terrible as it sounds, or the word, terrible as the word picture is, the only way to stay alive was to push yourself up on that nail that was driven between your feet. Otherwise... You suffocated. You couldn't breathe. And so when the legs were broken, and they did this, again, gory scene here, barbaric world. In many parts of the world, it's still very barbaric. But, but uh, they, they would take, the, um, uh, take like a sledgehammer and, and break the legs of those on the cross, and then immediately, or within a few minutes, they would die because they couldn't breathe. So that's why they, they ask Pilate to uh, 
break the legs. Verse 32 says, Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the uh, soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified. And his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. So, why does John include this detail that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not include? Well, one reason is this, that people had begun to spread the rumor that Jesus had never been resurrected, that actually what had happened, they stole his body. And they hid him, and he stole away, and there's never been any resurrection. Actually, what had happened is that there, the body had been stolen, that he never died. One of the reasons he's bringing this up. Now, does that sound crazy? Uh, I think it sounds crazy, but it is popular to this day. In fact, a Harvard professor, yes, Harvard, a Harvard professor wrote a paper that Jesus, in fact, escaped from the cross, married Mary Magdalene, went to modern-day Turkey, and had at least two children with her. A Harvard professor with a straight face read, you know, read that. I think it was actually, I think it was a, a, a publication even the size of a, a, of a book. Now, um, why does stuff like that, that happen anyway? Well, listen, it's, it's, it's because people know, they know that if this is true, if Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose after three days, and then was seen by 500 people, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, and then ascended to heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, if that really happened, they know that their time's up. Their time living is their own king, their own God, their, uh, you know, basically running their own life, calling all the shots. It's over. They got to surrender to this son of God who was resurrected from the dead. And so they will come up with any kind, any number of theories that no, that resurrection never happened. And one of them is, oh, he didn't really die. He, he, he didn't really die. He, he didn't die on the cross. They took the body and they hit him and then he he stole away. And so that's why, uh, uh, that's why it, verse 35 says uh, this. Well, actually, it says that in verse 34, it says a soldier pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. Verse 35 says, and he who has seen and testified and his testimony is true, he knows that he's telling the truth. John is speaking about himself here. And what he's saying is, don't believe that nonsense. I was there. I saw it. Blood and water coming from the heart, the side of Jesus. He's dispelling a, a, a rumor or a story that had been now circulating allegedly as a fact. No, don't believe any of that. I, I was there. Now, interesting thing about the water coming out, the blood in the water. I get self-conscious talking about medical conditions up here when I know there's doctors in the room, which there are. I'll do my best. But I understand from medical doctors or their writings that, that, that um, when a person is suffering from asphyxiation, they can't breathe over a long period of time, they're suffocating, that in fact, in their pericardium, that sac around the heart, fluid and water will gather. Water-like fluid will gather around the heart. Uh, in addition, get ready for this, the same thing happens when a man or woman suffers from hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock. You, and so you can just use that with your friends this week. They'll think you're really smart because I'm about to tell you what it is. Hypovolemic shock is what happens when a person has lost over 20% of their blood or their body fluid. Now, it makes all the sense in the world, right? Jesus was beaten unrecognizable by the time he even got to the 
cross, his body torn open by a Roman scourge. So uh, it's highly likely uh, this had this very condition had happened, and, the, and, and that's the reason for the blood and the water coming out. And so the Roman soldiers pierces Jesus' heart, blood and water flow out. John says, I saw it. Don't try to tell me that Jesus Christ did not, uh, did not die. I was there. I saw the blood, the water pouring out of his body. Okay, so verse 36 says, these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Let's take those verses one at a time. First verse 36. So much of what's happening in the days leading up to the cross and even at when his body is, uh, is there dead on the cross and then when his body is buried that are fulfillments of Old Testament prophecy and scripture. One of the fulfillments of Old Testament scripture was that not a bone shall be broken on the body of the Messiah. Now that, that, get, that gets a little deeper Actually, what that's a reference to is the Passover lamb. Remember, we, we discussed last week that Jesus was a fulfillment of the, the lambs that had been offered every day as sin offerings at the tabernacle and temple, but he's also the fulfillment of the slaying of, of the Passover lamb, which was a very different thing. Now, quickly, the Passover uh, the Passover occurred when? When the Israelites, on the night before the Israelites were taken out of the land of Egypt, where they were slaves. And remember what happened? There was 10 plagues against the Egyptians that basically forced the, the Egyptians to force the Jews out. And the 10th was what? It was the plague of the firstborn son. And before that last night, when there was going to be a plague of the firstborn son throughout the land, the Lord told Moses, in order for that not to happen to the Jewish people, you need to do this, tell the people to do this, take a lamb and, and, and slay the lamb, cut, take some of the blood of the lamb and put it over the doorpost and on both sides. It's a sign of the cross. And then the blood would have been dropping down. So... It was a sign of the cross. Little did they know that they were doing that. And then when the angel of death comes and sees that blood, it's going to pass over that house. It doesn't matter what had been done in that house. It doesn't matter whether there had been a murder or rape or stealing or whatever had been going on in that house. That's not what the angel of the Lord would look at. It would look just at the blood. And this is a picture of our salvation, folks. It's a picture of our salvation. God's looking for one thing, the blood that is on our foreheads by faith, by accepting Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. So uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, in the New Testament, it says, indeed, Christ, our Passover was sacrificed for us. But here's, the, here's to me, an incredibly cool verse connected directly to John chapter 19, speaking about the Passover lamb. In one house, the Passover lamb shall be eaten. You shall not carry any of the flesh outside of the house, nor shall you break one of its, shout it out, bones. And so that's why these soldiers, uh, they, they uh, are sent out with instructions. That they, the Roman governor had said, had said, you need to break his legs. They actually disobeyed the Roman governor's instructions. Why? Because of this. He, he was a fulfillment of a Passover lamb, but of course he had died already, so they didn't have to break his legs. So a fulfillment of that. Next verse uh, says, uh, the, a quote from Zechariah, a prophet Zechariah. Says, and again, another scripture says, verse 37, they shall look on him 
whom they pierced. Let me put on the projection screen a larger version of this. This is written about five or 600 years uh, before uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. It says, they will look on me, capital M, whom they pierced. The book of Zechariah, by the way, is just packed with messianic prophecies. It's, it's startling when you read through Zechariah. They will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Now, the partial fulfillment of this was the cross, but the Bible actually says the, uh, the, the, the fulfillment will not be complete until Jesus returns and Israel sees, wow, Jesus was everything that he said he was, and they will mourn. How could we have done that? Of course, all of us are responsible for his, uh, for his death. But wonderful fulfillment um, of Scripture there. So let's, uh, let's go on. But first, uh, you know, here's Jesus Christ. <laughs> the, 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 the prophet Isaiah calls him the wonderful. I, I love that name of Jesus. He's called the wonderful. He's the wonderful. The counselor, the prince of peace, the everlasting father, interestingly. Jesus is also given that name. The mighty God. He's dead on the cross. Jesus Christ, the Bible calls him the lion of Judah, the ancient of days, the king of glory. He's dead there. And as we talked about last week, all of history before him, looking towards him. Central event in history. All of history after him, looking back to him. Messiah dead on the cross. So let's continue, verse 38. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. And they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the customs of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. So they laid Jesus. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. So here in verse 38 and 39, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they were secret disciples, both of them. says, verse 38, Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly. And then verse 39, Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, he, he, was, he secretly came to Jesus in John chapter 3. Joseph, it says this of him in Mark 15, 43, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member. So that means a prominent council member. That's talking about the, he was a Sanhedrin member, which was a, he was a member of the governing council of all Jews everywhere in the world. He's a very important man. Another place he's called a rich man, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, come and took courage and went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. That's from Mark 15, 43. So, you know, this is a great time to pause and reflect. You may be in a place this morning or you may be in a place next week where you're thinking about your situation and you're thinking, there's no way out of here. <laughs> there is no way out of this place that I'm in. You have no idea what God's resources are. 
You have no clue. Let me tell you, these, the, the, the 11 apostles, remember Judas had hung himself by now, but the 11 apostles, last thing in the world that they wanted was to have Jesus given a Roman burial, which is they just take the body and they throw it in a common grave. There's a place uh, uh, south of the city of Jerusalem, the Valley of Hinnom, was a place of burning. Actually, Hades gets one, uh, one of the names uh, uh, for hell is taken from this place. It's just where dead bodies were thrown. Now, the 11 apostles, we know they were uneducated. They were common laborers. There was no way they were going to get in and get that body. And they were thinking, this is, this is awful. If crucifixion wasn't enough, what they're going to do to his body. Listen, they had no idea. God has so many resources that we don't know about. They had no idea there was a couple of people on the ruling Jewish council who were disciples in secret. So this guy, he, he, he goes into Pilate. He says he took courage. Nicodemus, same thing. John chapter 3. Nicodemus. It says, came to Jesus by night, secretly. And he went to Jesus and he said, no one could do all these miracles and not be from God. And what did Jesus say? This is one of the most glorious verses in the Bible. Unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of heaven. How many times since that day, probably about two years before, how many times did he repeat that? Or did that verse go over and over and over and again in his mind? You must be born again. You must be born again. You must be born again. But these men, they had been in secret. They just took public, they, they, they went public. They said, enough is enough. I, I'm just, I'm going out in the open. And what was it? Cross. It was the cross. Even the Roman centurion said, after he was, he was a pagan man, he was not a believer, he said, truly this man was a son of God, or is the son of God, after Jesus died. And, 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 and Nicodemus, Joseph, they saw what had happened, and then that's it. I'm not living like a hypocrite anymore. I'm going public. And they took courage, and they, and they went out. Listen, some of you, Your secret disciples, that's what you are. You're a secret disciple at your work, at your school, in your family. You're a secret disciple. And you know something? I don't say this to condemn you. You know why? Because the Bible never condemns. You notice how the Bible never condemns Joseph or Nicodemus? Never does. does mention that, they're, uh, that, that, that they were in secret, but it doesn't it really doesn't condemn them for that. You're going to go to heaven even if you remain a secret disciple. One small problem. You're going to be miserable if you stay in hiding. I was in the Beatitudes this week. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the, are the peacemakers. Blessed are the meek. And then it gets to what? Blessed are those who are persecuted. And that word blessed, interesting word, I, I've been you know, studying the Beatitudes for years and years. Really, in my opinion, the best translations translate it happy. Happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are those who mourn. Sound crazy? There's a rejoicing in mourning. Happy are those who are meek. And happy are those who are persecuted. Now, there's a choice to sort of avoid persecution of, of taking, going public and stop being secret and going out uh, and, and going public with your faith, and that's being miserable. And by the way, this is, um, this is not a statement. If, if someone's living in a Muslim country or something like that, I'm, I'm talking about the United States of America here. <laughs> Happy are those who are persecuted. Now, there's a lot of... Um, college students here, and uh, there's a story I tell, oh, about every five or six years, and I don't think I've told it in five or six years, but it is the type of story that I think it'd be great to share a hundred times. If I could, I would. When I was in college, I went to Wake Forest University in North Carolina. I um, was not a Christian. I didn't become a Christian after college, but 
I uh, did a lot of stupid things in college. But my sophomore year, there was um, a suite of about nine rooms that I spent a lot of time in throughout the year. And the reason was is a bunch of guys I had lived with freshman year were in that suite. So I used to go over there, spend a lot of time there. And there was uh, a man in that, uh, in that suite of rooms. His, he was a kid at the time. His name was Greg Johnson. Greg Johnson was his name. And he was a Christian. And this was one wild suite of rooms. I, I mean, it was crazy suite of rooms. But, but, but uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a dorm hall. And, uh, but he was right in the middle of it. And I tell you, this guy, if there's ever been the real deal as a Christian, Greg Johnson is it. I, I, I have never met a more kind, loving person my roommate, my freshman roommate, nicknamed him Psycho, and used to tell him that Psycho, <laughs> you know. And you know what he did? What, what do we do when 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 someone calls us Psycho or something or a name for being a Christian? What do, what do we do? I'm being persecuted. We go running to our friend. <laughs> Greg just used to smile. He used to smile. Isn't that the right reaction? Like, that's what the world's supposed to do. They're supposed to persecute. And blessed are the persecuted. <laughs> Happy are the persecuted. But he was just very, uh, he, was, he was always in the Word. I used to go there literally at one or two in the morning. He used to keep his room completely dark except this tiny little lamp. And he was reading the Bible at one in the morning. This is craziness. to Someone like me at the time. But anyway, so... Sophomore year, I was in a uh, sociology class with this guy, and I was in the back of uh, the classroom, and he was immediately in front of me. And the sociology uh, professor, and by the way, all college students, beware of your sociology class. There's just, I'm sorry, I have to say it, there's just a lot of nonsense in the garbage. <laughs> That's a warning for you. But anyway, let me move on. So the professor uh, goes on, and he, uh, he says this. He says, so, why do people go to church? And so he said, why do people go to church? And so one person raised their hand and said, well, because they did it growing up with their family, so they just continued doing it. And someone else said, well, because, you know, they're pressured into doing it. Or some, someone else said, well, you know, uh, uh, it's, it, it's, it's a custom in certain geographical areas of, of the country. And then, you know, Greg, right in front of me, I see him. He's getting, like, antsy, you know. <laughs> I could see him visually, you know. He, he, he was not looking good. But then the professor said this. He really said it, quote, direct quote. He said, well, how about this one? People go to church because they're sadomasochists. They like going to church and getting beaten by a verbal whip by the past, by the preacher. That's what they like. And at that moment, Greg's like, he raises his hand, and he said this. He said, I don't know about anyone else, but I go to church to worship God. Now, I'm in the back of the room, okay, of this classroom, and so this is what I saw. Everyone just looking at it like that. And, and, and you know, the professor, these, these words went right into this guy's heart. This guy goes, oh, yeah, you know, I'm an Episcopalian, and, and our book is like a bo our book, of, it's like our Bible, our book of prayer is. I'm thinking, what does that have to do with your question? I, the guy was convicted and guilted out because of Greg. Uh, they, they went and did this little interchange, but he was not, Greg Johnson was not a secret disciple. And, and let me tell you, I was not a Christian. That had a big impact on me, your pastor. And, 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 you know, at some point, we got to come out of hiding. We have to. we got to come out of hiding if we're going to be fruitful, if we're going to have that joy in our life. Blessed, happy are those, the persecuted, those who come out. You know what happens many times, too? There's no persecution at all. We were just lied to. So, so coming out... Uh, and, and they were secret disciples, and, but, but they came out and they had this incredible opportunity. Can you imagine bearing 
the, the prince of glory. They got to bury him. And think about what we miss when we stay in hiding. But they got to bury the prince of glory. So I'm going to call the worship team up. Just going to read the last few verses here. Verse 40 says, Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in, stri in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had been laid. Don't miss this, that in the garden of Eden, man originally fell and all was lost. In a garden, two gardens, the Garden of Gethsemane and this garden, everything was bought back again. The Lord always gets the last laugh. He really does. The last rejoicing. A new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Verse 42, and there they laid Jesus because of the... Jewish preparation day for the tomb was nearby, meaning they didn't go bury him miles outside of the city, right there next to Jerusalem, right next to the cross, right near the cross, Jesus was buried. So Jesus' burial. You know, usually when I'm thinking um, about the last couple chapters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a lot of times when we think, you know, just in our mind, when we think of those last couple of chapters, we're like, we, we, we jump right from the death of Jesus to the resurrection. We shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. I shouldn't do that. We will miss something. There is a reason that all four Gospels mention this. The burial. There's a significant amount of ink dedicated to his burial. We we can't, we don't want to just jump from, from the death to the resurrection. Why? Really, there's uh, there's a couple things. One, I think I think that um, there's of course the fulfilled prophecy. There's the fulfilled prophecy. In, in um, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, uh, it says this. It says, this is Paul. He's saying, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So see here you see he was buried. So the prominence of him being buried. Buried. Now, in the Apostles' Creed, many of us grew up with this in, in, in church, standing up and reciting this at church. It says, he was born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified, uh, dead, and was crucified, died, and buried. All of this was a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 says this in uh, I think it's verse 9. It says, And they made his grave, the Messiah's grave, with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Meaning, so, in, in, among many other things, uh, why do we not want to ignore the, the burial of Jesus? It's because of fulfilled prophecy. And, and obviously, there's a lot of ink given to it. He was buried. We don't want to just jump over those things. But there's something else as well that, that is just so important. You know, Jesus could have taken off right from the cross right after he died. I mean, it could have would whoosh, you know, like a space shuttle or something, right, right, right at that point. He could have done that. Actually, that did happen, right? And 40 days later, Acts chapter 1, He's there, and he goes whoosh, right up into the clouds. But that didn't happen. They took that bloody, beaten body, and they washed it, and they 
prepared it and they buried that body. You know, here's why I think it's a really, really big deal. Of course, anytime that there's a fulfillment of prophecy, that's a big deal because that certifies the truth of, of, of the Bible. But th- here's why I think it's a really big deal. You know, when Jesus agreed to leave heaven, the Father's bosom, and come to earth, that is one huge step down. That's a big step down. When he agreed not only to come to earth, but to come into a poor family, that's yet another step down. When he agrees to die, that is a step down. But when he agrees to be buried, that is as low as it gets. Can there be any more picture that is more striking, more sobering, more tragic? a picture of really the condition of man than a dead body, a man or woman buried or in a casket or a tomb in complete darkness. Is there any condition, any picture that's more telling of the fallenness of man than that? I don't think so. Jesus was buried Because once again, he is identifying with the human race in all its brokenness, in its fallenness, in its sin. It's buried in a tomb in complete darkness. He was crucified. He was dead. He was buried. But the third day, he rose from the dead. Why don't we stand for the closing worship song? If you've been stirred about anything, you can come up and pray. If you've been asked to pray, please come up. What Christ did... For you, for me, for the human race. And yeah, we don't. We don't want to skip over. We don't want to go just from uh, from the death to the resurrection, do we? Because just reading about the burial, oh, it just makes him love love him more. And really, that's what this is all about. That's why we read the Bible. So we'll love him more, more passionately. When we do that, we respond with a life that runs hard after him and a life of worship. The more we love him, the more we worship. And the Father is calling, has been calling for the last 2,000 years those who worship him in spirit and truth. I'm going to close in prayer, and then you can come up and pray and wall worship. Father, we just thank you so much for this, for this picture. Wow, Lord, it's... it's it does. It makes us, makes us love you even more, Lord. Thank you for doing that in our hearts. And yes, Lord, we, we come out of secret, Lord, when we read about the cross and the burial. We want to come out, Lord. Yes, I am a Christian. I am a follower of Jesus. Do that work in all our hearts, Lord. Do it in my heart. Know how we want to be, how we desire to be. It's a reflection of the resurrected Christ. Your word says that we can be, Romans chapter 6, that even as we went to the tomb with him and died... When he rose to, le- to life, we, we too can walk in the newness of his resurrection, Lord. We love you for that, and we worship in Jesus' name.